Hey, hi guys. Good morning and uh, great to see you on this Sunday morning. And quite a few of you have come in and I'm sure hey, that... Hi guys. Good and morning. I'm sure and, that uh, 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 most of you will be joining a little later as usual. But it'll be great that uh, you can all catch up eventually. This will be available as a recording uh, even later. And uh, today we're going to uh, see some images uh, with the gynecology. And tomorrow we'll do obstetrics. And uh, I've tried to get uh, mostly the topics which are coming in the exams so that we can see the images and discuss a little bit about the topics. I'll throw a challenge uh, to you with all the images. And uh, I hope all of you can get that. And I'm sure that uh, I'll try and see if I can coordinate with the uh, messages which you're sending so that we can um, have a kind of a live class while we're doing this session. And uh, needless to say that uh, NEET exam will come with some surprising topics. Most of the times uh, we are able to discuss 90, 95% of the topics which have come in all the exams and generally we're able to touch all the topics. But 5% uh, topics, I'm saying all the subjects, 5% topics will come, you know, some new questions will come and some new topics will come and uh, you'll be a little surprised that you missed that. So it doesn't matter if you do 95% right, I think you're going to get a good rank, right? So. Uh, let's not uh, get little, um, I mean, let's not get too perturbed with what we are going to face in the exams. Let's keep doing the preparation. Uh, you know, it's uh, important to go through the process properly. What eventually happens in the exams, like they all say, you have to uh, give your best and hope for the best results. So let's go through the process properly. If you go through the process properly, the results will be good. Okay. Chala. So we'll start with the images. And the first image which I have in front of me is of a uterus. If I show you this uterus, uh, this is the ultrasonography of a uterus. And this is the boundary of the uterus. And inside the uterus, there is a triple layered endometrium. Now, what's this triple layered endometrium? This one is the triple layer of the endometrium. It's a nice mid-cycle uterus, which is very good for an implantation of an embryo to happen. So this is what is the uterus. And this is the myometrium here in the uterus. And this triple layer, this is the endometrium. So this is the endometrium here of triple layers. So this basically means that the endometrium, which is growing from both the NC, from here, the endometrium is growing. And then from here, the endometrium is growing. And in between the two endometriums, you know, from top to bottom, like I'll show you here also, see, this is the uterine cavity. And the endometrium grows from here. And the endometrium grows from here. So you see there's a line in between, you know, that line in between. So that's what makes the triple layer. So when we see the triple layer endometrium, this is the normal endometrium. So the question is the next one. What is this uterus? Yes. What is this uterus? Come on, tell me. This, I mean, like, okay, let me at least show you the outlining. I'll help you with the outline of the uterus here. Yes. That's the outline of the uterus. That is the uterus. Believe it or not, it's a uterus. Some I, I gave this image to somebody in a live class and I said, uh, what is this? So the student asked me, sir, how do you know that this is a uterus? That was a very good question. Okay, it is a uterus because I'm saying it's a uterus. So tell me what type of uterus it is. Yes, let's see what you guys have thought of as an answer here. So no answers have come so far. All right. So you have to see that you're not able to make out how well you could make out here. See, myometrium and endometrium. This is the endometrium here. This is the endometrium here. And the myometrium I've written already. So in this, you cannot distinguish the endometrium from the myometrium. So this is the endometrium. Somewhat this is the endometrium. And this is the myometrium here. This is the muscle of the uterus. This is the myometrium here. And you're not able to distinguish it too well. So this is what happens. Loss of endometrial and myometrial distinction. All right. And yes, that is what is known as a adenomyosis. This is adenomyosis uterus. And you know about adenomyosis. You know, it always comes in your exams. It's generally the disorder of women who are uh, multiparous. And it's around 40 years and beyond. You get adenomyosis. And women who have two, three children. And the uterus has a uniform enlargement. See, this uterus is uniformly enlarged. You're not seeing, you know, you're not seeing loculated um, lumps like this. Those loculated lumps means fibroid. This uterus is uniformly enlarged. And you don't have this distinction. You know, you don't know where the endometrium and myometrium. See, somewhere here, 
somewhere here the endometrium and myometrium is <coughs> excuse me somewhere here the endometrium and the myometrium is having a change but you cannot make it out see here in this picture you can see the endometrium is here and the myometrium is here wait i'll take out all of this then you'll see better see the this is the endometrial lining here and this is the myometrium here so endometrial myometrial distinction is very easy in this but in this you cannot see the endometrial and myometrial distinction so that's why i'm saying loss of endometrial uh, myometrial distinction and uh, hyperplasia of the muscle uniform enlargement of the uterus and sometimes you'll see lakes of endometrial blood. You know, uh, let me see if I can show you here. See, there'll be some lakes of endometrial blood like this. Some lakes like this you'll see. So I've made them dark lakes. This is exactly how it look in the ultrasound. So this is the lakes of the blood which has gone from the uterine cavity into the uterine muscle. So these lakes also you will see. So that is what is known as an adenomyosis. So... Another picture of the uterus showing adenomyosis. See, this you're just seeing some tissue. Here you cannot make out another good example. You see, the endometrium is here somewhere, but you're not able to make out the distinction between endometrium and myometrium. So this is the very important point. So I'm just uh, giving you the list here. There's a subendometrial halo. There's a, um, uh, you know, this uh, sometimes you will see beyond the endometrium, you'll see a halo here, which is not very visible in this picture. And there will be heteroechoic deposits in the uterine myometrium. Heteroechoic. You know, see this, uh, there is this, um, if you consider it just on this side, you are seeing this white spot here, then white spot here, white spot here. In between, you are seeing slightly gray spots. Heteroechoic shadows. See here, like that. So, heteroechoic. So, heteroechoic deposits are seen in the myometrium and lakes of myometrial blood, which is not there. See, in this picture, you may see there is one small lake here another small lake here. It's not a very characteristic lake which, uh, you know, uh, uh, somewhat, uh, um, you know, a junior uh, doctor can make out. But yes, there are some lakes of endometrial blood here also. Um, the pictures, if you get in your exam, will be very clear. The lakes will be nicely seen. So, there will be lakes of myometrial blood, heteroechoic hetero deposits in the uterine myometrium and subendometrial halo. Now, what is very important? The junctional zone. The junctional zone, which is around 5 to 8 millimeter, it is more than 12 millimeters. So, what is this junctional zone? Again, I'll show you this here. If you see, normally, between the endometrium and myometrium here, there is this junctional zone of around 5 to 8 millimeters. Now, this junctional zone, can you see here? Nicely shown in this one. See, this has increased so much, this junctional zone. This is more than 12 millimeter. See here also you'll see the junction zone has increased considerably. So increase in the junction zone more than 12 millimeters. Uh, some books say 15 millimeters, some books say 12 millimeters. But uh, no access 12 millimeters, so we'll stick with 12 millimeters. So junction zone is increased. And that is what is adenomyosis. All right. Let's see what you guys have asked me here. Adenomyosis can't see in, can't be seen in exams, sir. No, I think exams they will show you. See, what happens is that uh, the pictures in the exams will be even better than the ones which I have showed you. See, this is a good picture actually of adenomyosis. Exams, the pictures will be good. What happens is that when you recall the MCQs and you give us the choice that, sir, this came in the exam, and then we pick up some uh, MCQ, um, some picture from the internet or some things from the archives which we have in our laptops, those might not be so good. But the exam pictures will be good. They will ask you, adenomyosis, they will ask you. Yeah, maybe they will ask you the gross specimen. Uh, they might show you a uterus which will be really enlarged. You know, yeah, they might show you something like a big uterus like this. They'll show you a big uterus and that big uterus with a myohyperplasia. The cavity will be so small and they'll show uterus with myohyperplasia like that. It comes, it comes in the exam. I don't know, this is a favorite question. And what is important, you must remember the MCQ, which is the easy MCQ which has come. That what is the size of the uterus? The uterus never increases more than 14 centimeters or they will say 14 weeks in size. So 14 weeks, ka it is like the 14 weeks of pregnancy size or they'll say 14 centimeters. So it never increased more than that. And it is seen in multi-paras women. And what is the treatment? Yes, best treatment of adenomyosis is hysterectomy. Anyway, because a woman is beyond 40 and she's having, uh, uh, you know, a lot of symptoms and she doesn't want any more pregnancies. So mostly hysterectomy is the best management. You should think in terms of a hysterectomy as the best answer. I can give a relief with GNRH and Logs painkillers and I can give her some relief with prostrons also. But the best treatment is indeed a hysterectomy. 
ियन <laughs> Uh, because of this SRY, uh, you know, the father, if he gives the Y chromosome, then because of this Y chromosome having this sex determining region Y, the baby will be a boy. And if this is not there, the baby will be a girl. So sex determining region is on the short arm of the Y chromosome. And this azoospermia factors are on the long arm. And there are three factors, azoospermia A, B and C. So your question is, which one is the most common? azoospermia factor micro deletion okay micro deletions have been regularly assessed in labs these days if a person has azoospermia then before we go ahead and do the investigations of uh, start giving treatment first thing what we do is find out what kind of azoospermia it is if it is because of a testicular cause if there is a testicular failure testicular azoospermia then we find out what kind of testicular failure it is is it the uh, because of having a azoospermia factor micro deletion so there are these azoospermia factors a b and c and if these are deleted micro deletions look when we have uh, chromosomes which are missing you know you make a karyotype uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes you make a karyotype and in that when you they show you the karyotype they'll show okay trisomy of 21 or monosomy of 40 of uh, you know uh, x chromosome so you'll write 45 x so so one chromosome will be extra one chromosome will be less so that number numerical deletion or addition is very easily seen now these are micro deletions micro deletions of the y chromosome so you'll see the y chromosome but you'll not see the micro deletion so you have to do something better to see the micro deletion so this is about the micro deletion now what i'm asking you the question is slightly ahead of that which type of micro deletion is the common micro deletion in azoospermia factors which are azoospermia factor deficiency may which is the most common type of micro deletion that's the question so yes c for common micro deletion of the azoospermia factor c is the commonest so i'll just give you all the list of things which is important okay so the short arm has the sex determining region y and the long arm has the all these azoospermia factors and azoospermia a is the proximal and azoospermia b is the central azoospermia c is the distal these are the three micro deletions which can happen and they've been given in three different colors the first one is in orange the second one is in pink and the third one is in green and they've given you the colors on the sides also so definite azoospermia happens okay fine let me tell you the commonest first and then i'll tell you what is the problem so the most common deletion, most common deletion is the azoospermia factor C. So C for common. That's how I told you to remember. The commonest micro deletion is this and this is the mildest. Okay, this is the mildest micro deletion. So when a person has azoospermia and there's the testicular cause of azoospermia, that means the LH and FSH is very high and the test is not making sperms properly. Then we find out whether the person has azoospermia because of micro deletion or not. If there is micro deletion and there is micro deletion of the AZFC, if this C micro deletion is there, then it is the commonest and this is the one which is likely to give some sperms in the testicular biopsies. Okay, so there is testicular, okay, there is these testes are not making sperms. Nothing is coming out in the ejaculate. Okay, this man in the penis, nothing is coming out. Now, 
what we can do? We can put a needle into this person's testes and do a aspiration. When I do the aspiration, which type of azospermia microdeletion may have some sperms? See, some sperm is good news, isn't it? I can take those sperms, just even one morphologically normal sperm. Remember, morphology is the single best criteria of the semen analysis. We've told you this many times. So even if there is one morphologically normal sperm in this azospermic man, and I do the aspiration of those sperms and take that one good sperm and put it into the oocyte directly by which procedure? Intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So I can give this man his own biological child. So which microdeletion is commonest? Azospermia factor C. And this will show some sperm. That's why it is known as the mildest condition. Now, most severe is the azospermia B. That's the most severe. Now, azospermia A is not the most severe, but it is definitely not a good thing to have. The best thing to have in this is azospermia factor C. Now, in azospermia factor A deficiency microdeletion, it is definite azospermia and the person will have a Sertoli cell only syndrome when you do the biopsy. So, what happens that when these people have azospermias, before we do the biopsies, we find out what type of micro deletions are there. If the micro deletion is AZFC, then only we do the biopsies. Before the biopsy, we should know if it is AZFC, then we should do the biopsy and we'll get some sperms in that. All right. So now I was telling you, how do you find out the micro deletions? You know, you'll see this Y chromosome, you know, this you call this a Y chromosome. This will be seen on the karyotype easily. Now, Y chromosome has a micro deletion, how you can make out. When in a karyotype, these are very small micro deletions you cannot make out. I was talking about this a little earlier. When you cannot make them out, what do you do? You will have to do a multiplex polymerase chain reaction. So yes, with that, you can easily make out this. Now, this is commercially available. These tests are commercially available nowadays. Okay, so yes, rather uh, tough uh, part uh, in your early part in the day. Um, don't, uh, most of the other topics are easy, but yes, this has come in your exams. So you must know a little bit about azospermia. Okay. All right. So let's move on and see something else. Uh, yeah, I wanted to tell you something about the age of uh, mothers and uh, fathers. So when I say about um, ovarian reserve, I say that it is best that uh, a woman has pregnancies between 25 to 35 years of age. And after that, the reserve will reduce and the chance of pregnancies will reduce. We know that very well. Now, what about a father's age? A father's age, yes, we know that fathers can have pregnancy, uh, have uh, their uh, wives getting pregnant even after 50 years of age. Even after 60, 70, men have known to father children even at 90 years of age. Correct. Men have sperms till they die. But what is the quality of the sperms? So that's what is now important. Increase paternal age. I'm just giving you some added information in this uh, topic. Increased paternal age is known to be a problem even in men. Although the man will be able to father a child, but there'll be more problems of achondroplasia, craniosynostosis, trisomies, recurrent pregnancy losses, and schizophrenia in the offspring. Yes, all of these problems are known to be coexisting with a person who is having more age and then trying to father a child. So it's best that men also have their children much earlier than 40 years. There's no point waiting for a pregnancy beyond 40 years, even in a man, to have a healthy child. Okay, the man will be able to father a child, but the child should be healthy. So that's why we say it's best to have a pregnancy before 40, even in a man. So also there is increase in numbers of diasomic sperms, diasomy in the sperm. See, the monosomy, trisomy, you know, what is diasomy? Having one or more chromosome presence twice, but without having the entire genome doubled. Some part is doubled, but not the entire genome. Right. So, name the instrument which is used in this procedure. Yes. Now, this is the easy question. Come on, tell me. Name the instrument here. So, uh, I want to know the name of the instrument. Okay. Yes, you know, it's a DNC being going. Okay, there's a uterus. You're seeing a curate here. There's a uterine cavity and somebody is scraping the uterus and some tissue is already coming out. You know, it's a DNC or a biopsy, endometrial biopsy. You can say whatever you want. But then, what is the, what is the, Instrument being used. Curate is not the name. Curate to likha wa Come on guys. What is the name of the curate? 
name of the curate batao so yes uh, there are lot of curates which come in your exams i like the blake's curate the blake's curate but yes that is you know i like things which are different the name which you have to know is sims the sims curate this is the sims curate the one which you are seeing here is the sims curate so yes these are the sims curates good yes quite a few you got it correct not bad sims curate correct so sims curate is the one which is used and um, this is uh, the various sizes and i go for the big ones because once i go inside the uterus i feel i should get a good chunk of endometrium when i'm doing a biopsy but yes be very careful okay if you're doing a endometrial biopsy or a curettage don't overdo especially when you're a junior gynecologist or a intern you know some of you get to do these things even when you're doing internship and uh, first pg second pg is enthusiastic uh, pg is doing a curettage and overdoing a curettage and causing injuries causes what yes it causes eschman syndrome so this is that instrument this instrument is the best friend of a gynecologist you know whatever we guys have to do gynecology if you you know the ultimate um, answer to all our problems in gynae is to do a curettage all right if there is too much of bleeding do a curettage if there is no bleeding do a curettage she may bleed if she is needing an abortion do a curettage if she is infertile okay do a curettage if she is having dysmenorrhea okay uh, dilate the cervix and do a curettage dilatation will help so dnc is invariably a right i mean uh, please don't quote me anywhere else uh, i'm just trying to take a class and tell you that dnc eventually comes in most of our managements okay so this instrument which is the best friend of a gynecologist can cause harm also if you're not using your instruments properly so please be careful when you're doing a curettage some of you will become gynecologists whether you like it or not yeah you want to become gynecologist how many gynecologists are men today ha huh? just say hi those who are becoming gynecologists okay that's the sims curate so uh, this is another picture of the sims curate here see this is the end uh, one end is the sharp end one end is the blunt end so when you are trying to take out um, you know sharp curettage is generally the last thing which we do you know when we do a curettage we start with the blunt end of the curate and after doing the curettage with the blunt end then the last thing we do is with the sharp curate so don't use a sharp curate much okay and uh, i think i'll stop here about the curettage so what are you guys saying so many highs so many gynecologists don't tell me and most of you boys huh all you guys mohibul mohibul islam you come back to me after one year and show me your gynae uh, pg uh, certificate you are doing it or not i want to find out you guys are all liars <laughs> okay if you are doing gynecology i'll be very happy it's a wonderful branch please those who you know what happens that we gynecologists create a lot of havoc uh, when you come to the departments and we are known to be uh, yeah we known to be short tempered and we short known to be very finicky and uh, we create a lot of havoc we know so because of what we do in the wards and what we do in the labor rooms you guys uh, tend to have a um, opinion about the subject even before you start uh, so yes uh, when you become a gynecologist don't create havoc and you guys uh, work hard and you guys uh, uh, should uh, love uh, taking care of uh, your patients and it is the only branch which gives you medical uh, exposure and surgical exposure at the same time and you can do ivf you can do fetal medicine you can do high risk medicine high risk fetal medicine and you can do uh, laparoscopy as a training i mean there is endless opportunities in obs and gynae it's a wonderful branch and i like my obstetrics you know uh, the best part of my whatever i do in my life you know my laparoscopic work or my ivf work or my gynae work or repairs or whatever i do the happiest time in the labor room uh, but yes these guys don't let me enter the labor room these days whenever i go there sir we'll do you you we'll call you when there's trouble anyway so uh, please think of gynae as a good option as your careers don't get uh, biased by what you see that's what uh, the message was okay that was the sims curate now in this picture there is a hysteroscope in the uterus and this hysteroscope is this hysteros hysteroscope is putting a instrument into the uterine cavity which is eventually going to be in the fallopian tube please see they have already placed this instrument on the other side what is this instrument being placed neat exam question 3 years back all right let's see are you guys up to 
स्टलाइजेशन करेक्ट नॉट मायरीना यस श्रेया पटेल गॉट इट एंड डॉक्टर सारिका all right good assure device yes it's the assure coil it is the assure coil all right so you'll get um, these kind of pictures assure coil assure coil it is a alloy of nickel and titanium nitinol nickel titanium alloy nickel and titanium alloy and uh, this when you place it causes fibrosis it causes fibrosis in three months so when the fibrosis in three months what do you have to tell the woman that first you have to do a hysteroscopy to place this instrument after placing the instrument three months the woman is told that you are not sterile for the next three months so uh, use some other method of contraception and uh, after three months yes you don't say that you're okay to go and have unprotected intercourse no you don't say that after 3 months you will do a hysterosalpingography so they will ask you this question this coil is placed hysteroscopically hysteroscopic placement so first you have to do a hysteroscopy to place the coil and then after 3 months you have to do a hsg to make sure that the tube is blocked so rather cumbersome a method I have never put a assure coil because my patients uh, in my country they will not listen for contraceptive advice. So they are, if at all they take some pills or take the IUCD or get a sterilization done, I'm happy. And uh, motivating them to come for a process of uh, hysteroscopy first, and then after three months come for another process of doing a hysterosalpingography. Uh, see, I've not placed it. Uh, yes, it is available as a trial. Otherwise, I've not seen being placed. Uh, I've yet to see a patient who's come to me with a assure coil. But yes, this is coming in your exams. Why it is coming in your exams? Because it is in Williams obstetrics. So if it is there in Williams, it can come in your exams. That's the basic punchline and basic rule. So impossible for you guys to read whole of Williams obstetrics, and uh, that's a very big book. But yes, uh, if there's a question which is coming in the exam and you don't find it anyway, you will get in Williams. So that's why it is there and it was asked. Now remember, when you're doing this um, uh, placement of this uh, instrument, this um, Azure coil. you can have some perforation while you placing this so you try to place this and this end of the coil goes out like this through the tube into the abdominal cavity so it can cause lot of bleeding so that's why you see here some part is kept inside the uterus so you can if there is bleeding and the patient is having uh, you know loss of blood pressure or loss of hemoglobin then what do you do you do another hysteroscopy and this end which was there in the cavity with that you hold it and pull it out so that is one complication which can happen perforation through the tube into the abdominal cavity that's one thing which is likely to happen but not so common and 3 uh, months is the waiting time assure coil now next question this is the figo classification let's see um uh, what have you guys asked me is it reversible ak47 no it is not reversible once fibrosis happens then uh, the tube is lost for life yes you can after 3 months or 6 months you can pull out the coil if you want i mean there's no point uh, this tube is anyway spoiled it is not reversible at all i mean if she wants to have children after this you pull out the coil and do an ivf if it all she changes her mind you can do in vitro fertilization still but you it is not reversible all right so what is this uh, uh, this is the figo classification of leiomyomas and in this what is this uh, location of the fibroids you have to know this i'm sure all of you reading about this uh, you know always start from the uh, classification you should start from 4 from type 4 you should start because all fibroids start in the uterine muscle so when we say fibroids they all start in the uterine muscle first so they start here from here they can come towards the cavity or go towards the serosa so depending on how close they come to the cavity it can become a three so it is indenting the cavity and two it is partly in the cavity and one it is mostly in the cavity so depending how much it is coming to the cavity and zero it is hanging in the cavity similarly it can go outwards when it goes outwards it can become a five that it is mostly in the muscle but partly in the serosa 
type 6 it is partly in the muscle but mostly in the serosa and type 7 it is outside it is serosal and it is mostly hanging so sub serous pedunculated or sub mucosal pedunculated so this is um, sub mucosal sm and this is sub serosal now this is uh, how we remember always start from 4 intramural from there it goes outside or inside now my question for this image is what is this 25 fibroid yes what is the 25 fibroid so if you look at the 25 fibroid this 25 fibroid means there is one part of the fibroid which is jutting into the uterine cavity one part of the fibroid is coming out into the serosa so this fibroid has two aspects, one in the mucosal part and one in the serosal part. So this is what is known as a hybrid fibroid. This is a hybrid fibroid and a hybrid fibroid is um, uh, when a fibroid has two denotations. Sometimes it might be much bigger, so it will be much more inside the cavity. So it may become a 1-5 fibroid or it might be just indenting the cavity like this 3. I will try to show you here. Wait a minute. Yeah. So this three here, this fibroid, suppose it was somewhat like this. So now this will partly coming here. So what is this fibroid now? So partly coming and in indenting the muscle. So here it is a three and coming here into zero size is looking like a five. So this becomes a three, five fibroid. So a one fibroid may have one fibroid may have two denotations or two parts, two aspects. So that is a hybrid fibroid and this 2-5 is the common one which they ask you in the exams and um, this um, fibroids classification is coming in your exam so please go ahead and read about it okay and um, fibroids uh, they're asking you about the um, apart from the regular myomectomies they're asking you about laparoscopic myomectomies they're asking you about the hysteroscopic myomectomies so laparoscopic myomectomy which type you can do so laparoscopic myomectomy, laparoscopic, you can easily do for a 7, you can do for a 6, and yes, some of us can do for a 5 easily. 4 also is done, 3 also is done, but uh, that those are maverick surgeons, and when we do those, uh, we, we are prepared for telling the patient that uh, we may enter the cavity, and they might be bleeding while doing a laparoscopic surgery. So easy questions are, are asked in PG entrance exam. Uh, you know, the set facts. They'll not ask you rare things which uh, a gynecologist will see in his practice. So, what are the easy fibroids which can, can be taken by laparoscopy? Type 7, type 6 and type 5. Type 5 also is not so easy. So, type 7, type 6 is the easiest. Type 5, maybe. That's your answer. Now, what are the ones which can be taken off from here? This passage, hysteroscopically. Now, hysteroscopically, we say a type 0 or a type 1 can be taken out hysteroscopically. And type 2 also can be taken out, but type 2 will bleed a lot. So, uh, again, the maverick surgeons can do a type 2 also hysteroscopically. Otherwise, type 0 and type 1 hysteroscopically. And, um, okay, how many fibroids you can take out when you're doing? How many fibroids you can take out laparoscopically? So, there is a limit to that, you know. Uh, less than or equal to 5 centimeters, there's a fibroid. Then 3 to 4, you can remove. And if it is less than or equal to 15 centimeter, then one such fibroid can be removed. So that's the criteria of laparoscopic myomectomy. So if you're doing a laparoscopic myomectomy, you should keep in these limits that three to four fibroids of uh, five centimeters in lesser size or one fibroid. If it is a big fibroid, then just one. Most of us have exceeded this limit many times, but then that's what happens in practice as you become more and more experienced in your laparoscopic work and you can do much beyond this but then limits which are for all regular doctors and what is an exam answer so that is what you should know what can be done and what your professors have been doing and what i've been doing is nobody's business see that way medicine will not be easy to follow so what are these set guidelines so that is what you should know okay uh Is this pre-op classification by which this is by? It's a good question, um, Dr. Sachin Kumar. So how do you know all of this fibroids? Yeah, that's what is a good question. So this is done by a 
ultrasonography that you know what is the location of the fibroid and um, which uh, you know like uh, let's see this picture the first picture of the day if there's a fibroid here like that so this is an ultrasound which shows me this so you can see this fibroid is going a little bit towards the serosa and it is indenting this so this is a three five fibroid or you may just get a fibroid like this this is a type four fibroid so this is by the ultrasonography but yes the question is better answered by telling you that we can do this mapping of the fibroids yes Sachin what you asked me what is the method of doing this so the mapping of the fibroids can be done by ultrasonography but it is best by magnetic resonance imaging what is that mapping mapping of the fibroids so yes that's a good question doctor okay shall we? let's move on so this is the classification those who i'm sure this is there in all of your books and uh, this is how i remember i always start from type 4 remember this start from type 4 and then see uh, always uh, whenever you classify the fibroids you write about the muscle part of the fibroid first more than 50% in the muscle or less than 50% in the muscle like that. Even when they are talking about the serosal fibroid, again, the muscle part is mentioned first in the it uh, in the nomenclature. Now, there's another type of fibroid, which uh, I deliberately left out to discuss only later. And that is a fibroid, which is in the cervix here. Now, what is this fibroid? So please be careful. Sometimes they'll ask you questions um, you know, they want to trick you into a mistake. So see where is the fibroid. If it is above this part, then all this classification is valid, what I told you. Suppose it is in the cervix, then whether it is partly in the cervix like this or more like that, then we don't uh, call it, uh, you know, uh, 4, 3, 2, 1 like that. If it is in the cervix, we call it type 8. So please be careful. See where is the fibroid located. If in the cervix, just simply write type 8. Even if the fibroid has, suppose uh, the fibroid was here, a type 7 and it got detached. It got detached from here. The type 7 got detached and it is now sitting in the omentum. So it is taking blood supply from the omentum, that fibroid. So that is known as a parasitic fibroid. It might be under the diaphragm also sometimes. We have seen this. I've seen a, um, a fibroid in the omentum once, you know, when there was a lump in the omentum with the surgeons removed. And they called us that uh, this is looking as if there is a muscular thing and we are not very sure because we don't see this kind of tumors in the... So one of our, uh, my senior friends was called and we were juniors that time we went and saw. So yes, you can get them in many other places. So that is the parasitic fibroid. So this is the eight. Right. What is the name of this clip? This is a clip which is used for a laparoscopic sterilization. What is the name of this clip? So yes, laparoscopic clips and laparoscopic rings are used. And uh, laparoscopic clips are the best reanastomosis procedures. When you put, suppose there's a uterus like this, and there's the fallopian tube, and you put a laparoscopic clip here. So later, suppose this woman wants a reanastomosis. Somebody was asking me about reanastomosis or uh, reversal of procedure. AK47 was asking me. So that cannot be done in a case of uh, uh, Escher coil because the tube is totally fibrosed. But in this procedure, you can do a reanastomosis. You can cut this part later. You can cut this segment and reanastomose this segment. So which has the best reanastomosis success? So laparoscopic sterilization by clips has the best reanastomosis. I've written RA. Best reanastomosis is by laparoscopic clips. Now, that information I think most of you knew. Now, what is this clip? This is the Hulka clip. Hulka clip. All right. And this next one is the Filsche clip. So, what is the difference? Hulka has teeth. Can you see? There are teeth in this Hulka. So, between the teeth, there is a formation of a U. Ah, my way of remembering things. 
if you remember otherwise also it's fine so uh, hulka clips have teeth and uh, the plain uh, clips are known as the fill shape okay let's see what you guys are writing no this is not fellow this is okay so you got confused between yes you got confused between hulka and fill shape so hulka has a u okay teeth between teeth there's a u which is formed that's how i remember i'm sure you will remember otherwise also chalo aage chalte hain let's see what is next okay these are the types of hymens and you got a question in your neat exam last year now let us see what is the first one this uh, normal hymen uh, this woman is of course uh, sexually active because you see the hymen is this hymenal opening is not smooth it is irregular so hymen is see there's a there's a evidence of tear in the hymen so this is a, obviously a sexually active lady now what are the other types of hymen so this one came in your exam this is a imperforate hymen and this one is a micro perforate and this is a cribriform so mcq was what is this type there were two mcqs which came this came last year and this came many years back so the first one of of course this this one is the imperforate hymen you can see the hymen opening is there it is not i mean hymen opening is not there it is uh, that it's a cannulation defect uh, please remember this imperforate hymen this hymenal defect this is not a mullerian defect these are cannulation defects mullerian defects are higher okay so transverse vaginal septum is a mullerian defect but imperforate hymen is a cannulation defect okay so uh, there's a problem of the cannulation of the urogenital sinus so yes lower one fifth of the vagina is made by the urogenital sinus and there's a improper cannulation of this then there will be a imperforate hymen never mind so uh, what is this last one last one is the septate hymen let's see who got this correct all right quite a few of you got it correct most of you got it correct not bad chalo theek hai then you know this one let's move on yeah by the way uh, how will this present imperforate hymen so you must understand imperforate hymen and transverse vaginal septum what's the difference so imperforate hymen will present here and a transverse vaginal septum is at this level so in both the cases when this girl gets to be let's say 13 years or 14 years she'll actually start menstruating inside of her body the uterus will start menstruating so blood will collect here in the uterus blood will also collect in the vagina in a imperforate hymen like this it will also collect in a case of sept transverse vaginal septum like this but now this is where you have to know the distinction because that's the mcq which came once so when there is when there is a imperforate hymen and when there is a septate uterus where is the swelling when you do a per rectal examination yes that's the mcq so when you do a per rectal examination if you see this one here so in the first picture this one when you do a pr the swelling is lower down see the swelling is here so you'll feel the bulge here itself throughout the rectum you'll see a bulge from the anterior part of the uh, from the anterior part of the rectum there'll be bulge of the vagina but in a transverse vaginal septum see in this one the transverse vaginal septum the bulge will be a little higher so the mcq language might be a little different that in a case of a transverse vaginal septum where do you feel the bulge you will feel the bulge in the rectum a little higher so that's why that's how you can distinguish clinically whether it's a transverse vaginal septum or a imperforate hymen both of these will present to you with primary amenorrhea and on the ultrasound you'll see that there is collection of blood in the uterus and in the vagina that is what is known as a yes blood in the uterus is known as a hematometra hematometra and blood in the vagina is known as a hemato holpos so that's the added point which you should know okay
Fine. Um, uh, postmenopausal osteoporosis. Hematocorpus, all right. Nitya Shri, you are going off the topic, but fine, we finished that. No discussion uh, on this anymore, right? Okay, fine. Uh, I've not started discussion on this instrument. Somebody asked me the drug of choice for osteoporosis. Now, there's a lot of controversy on that, but uh, let me tell you, I mean, uh, if I knew that, then I would have given you that MCQ here. This MCQ came in INICT exam, and that was the MCQ, which I'm so happy that it came, that which of the following is the best drug for osteoporosis after 60 years of age? All of you know that MCQ has come, all right? Which is the best drug for osteoporosis after 60 years of age? So yes, after 60 years of age, all of you have written bisphosphonates, and I also agree it is bisphosphonates. So if it is... After 60 years of age, it is bisphosphonates. So obviously, before 60 years of age, it is something else. Yes. I mean, go by the logic of the AIMS exam, the INICT exam. They ask, what is the drug of choice after 60 years of age? And all of you written bisphosphonates. Every teacher, pharmac and medicine and ortho and gynae, all four of us who answer this question, all of us agree it is bisphosphonates. But please see, uh, please read between the lines. If after 60 years it is bisphosphonates, then what is it before 60 years? It is something else. And that something else is estrogens. So when a woman gets into menopause at 50, what is the drug of choice for osteoporosis? Definitely it is estrogens. And that's what is written in your Shaws. And Shaws is written three times in one page. You know, twice in the front of the page. When you reverse the page, you'll see it once more. The drug of choice for osteoporosis everywhere in gynae books, it is written as estrogens. I know the controversy exists. Orthopedicians, physicians, and they'll quote Harrison, they'll quote pharmacology books. But hello, when it is written in your standard books, and that is gynae book is Shaws, and it is Novax, it is written straightforward that it is estrogens, the drug of choice. And then they have said in these books that after 60, the drug of choice is bisphosphonate. And now that is the question which has come in your INICT exam that what is the drug of choice after 60 years of age? So when there are so many clues and when there is so much of proof, then we should go what is written in the books. I agree that the Royal College says that you should have a better use of bisphosphonates than estrogens in hormone replacement therapy. I agree Royal College says that. But the American College says more of estrogens. Then which one do you agree to? Please, guidelines are for postgraduates. Latest guidelines and follow the guidelines. WHS said this day before yesterday. So we'll write the MCQ as that. Please, WHS is going to say many things, many uh, evenings. They'll sit together and have a meeting and they'll send a guideline. You guys don't have to follow them blindly, please. All guidelines are meant to be implemented after the government of India decides. Not because you and me sit in a, a Zoom session and decide, nee, WHO has written that, so we'll follow that now. You know, uh, somebody was discussing with me about uh, viability of the fetus. Fetal viability is very much 28 weeks in our country even now. It is not reduced to 24 weeks. No, WHO has suggested. Yes, WHO has suggested because Americans say viability is 20 weeks. Europeans and Britishers say it is 24 weeks because they can save their babies at 24 weeks and beyond. We cannot save our babies after uh, 24 weeks. Most of these babies are going to die. Some babies will survive if they're born at 27, 28. Few occasional babies. Most will die. So after 28, the babies will survive. So that's why viability in India is very much 28 weeks. Now, WHO has suggested, but we're not going to blindly follow that. It does not change anywhere in the government hospitals and the big hospitals I'm talking. I wish I could name some uh, sources, but that is unfair. I will not want to use my friends' names and um, the colleges and things. That is unfair. I'm just telling you, this is confirmed that it is 28 weeks. So bisphosphonates as the drug of choice of osteoporosis, I'm so sorry, it is not. We have to say estrogens. After 60 years, go ahead and say bisphosphonates. And viability is very much 28 weeks in a country. Don't change it to 24. What has changed? Yes, MTP can be done till 24 weeks. Correct. Now, let us discuss, yes, OBS is tomorrow, but then since somebody brought this up, we can do MTP till 24 weeks. Correct. We can save babies only after 28 weeks. That is also correct. So what is this 24 to 28 weeks period? Can you do an MTP at 26 weeks? No, no, no. 
legally not permitted can you save a baby which is born at 26 weeks no we can't save it so that is the problem in a country this is that gap 24 to 28 uh, i call it the ram bharosa gap we don't know what to do there is no official statement on this gap earlier what it was before 20 weeks or till 20 weeks we can do an mtp and after 28 weeks is viability this gap was much bigger 20 to 28 was ram bharosa now it is 24 to 28 that we don't know what to do and what to answer so what is for clear in your mcq exams before 24 weeks or till 24 weeks we can do an mtp and after uh, 28 weeks is viability this is what you have to know i'm sorry this is how it is 24 to 28 they're not going to ask you seriously they're not going to ask you the figures the straightforward facts are not clear there of course yeah, there are some pediatricians there are some very good hospitals i'm sure in aims they must be trying in gangaram hospitals the uh, places which have all the equipment and all the facilities keep the babies for 2 months when they are born at 26 weeks and save the baby and give a healthy baby can happen but 99% of the hospitals in a country can't save such babies and you know occasionally in your hospital I mean, whichever medical college you are from occasionally one baby will be saved at 26 weeks or 700 baby was saved and occasionally that baby's picture will be there and you also know as in terms that how many babies keep dying in the nurseries and in the uh, in the labor rooms when they are born at 26 25 weeks so that's what is the why did i do this discussion away from the images because you must understand that guidelines are for post graduates and consultants for you what is written in a book is important now if the book is old edition and new edition is not come and some new information is come we are here to help you with that we are here to help you with that all right there is a talk about active stage of uh, labor when is it active stage all the partograms are still at 4 cm so i have not changed the answer i know if you know who then i also know who guys who is saying 5 cm some a lot of people were telling us it is 6 cm because the americans are saying 6 cm who is saying 5 cm we are still at 4 cm no official statement has come that the partogram will be changed to Five centimeters of active stage. No, the partogram still starts at four centimeters in all the hospitals. So till it is not changed, it is four centimeters. I can't help it. So we know what you are discussing, guys. Come on, if you know it, then I'll obviously know it. But we have to understand what is there in the books and what is there as recommendations in our country. Okay, what has come in our journal? It has come on the online thing. Please don't follow that blindly. I know that you guys get disturbed very easily when you see some uh, bit coming out from some source on the internet. So please don't follow it blindly. Okay, chalo. Uh, let's see what you guys are writing. Uh, relaxed in nature. Who says twenty weeks? America says twenty weeks. Twenty-two weeks is yeah, twenty and twenty-two weeks. Both American figures. You are correct. Okay. What is this cannula? This is the Leach Wilkinson cannula. Lulu, Doctor Lulu is correct, and um, this is the cannula which is uh, used for, uh, you know, this is a. Can you see? There's a. Uh, there are serrations here on the top, and these are the screws by which you can uh, fix a cannula. Like if there's a uterus here, you can push this cannula inside, and then you snip it. I'm mean, I'm so sorry. When you, when you turn it, uh, where it goes and fixes. So when it is fixed here, then you can inject the dye. So we use it for a histosalpingography. Yes, correct. It is used for HSG, but it is also used for the laparoscopic and laparoscopy and chromotubation. We call it lap and dye, laparoscopy and chromotubation or dye test. Chrom is dye, isn't it? We can say laparoscopy and chromotubation. While I'm doing a laparoscopy like this, I'm looking at the uterus. My uh, uh, intern or my first APG will push some dye from below. And that will come into the uterus and will show whether the tube is patent or not. So at both the time, I use this instrument. So uh, I can show you that uh, this is one of my patients. We are doing the tissue scanography. All right, there's a lot of uh, oh, that's the noise of my forty where I did it. I think I should cut the volume. It's all right. You can listen to that. Once more. Right. That's my voice over the OD. So can you see now? See, this is the uterine cavity. What you can see in the uterus when you do a histosalpingography, you can see the cavity. You can see the cavity. All right, and you can see the tube. See here, this is the tube. You can see the cavity, and you can see the tube. 
but this is a good test for just knowing tubal patency. It is not the best test for the anatomy of the woman. So if there's a person who is infertile and she's uh, not able to conceive and one of the tests, so preliminary tests for investigating her tubal patency is hysterosalpingography. And I seriously don't like this test too much. It is uh, done under some uh, IV sedation and it caused a lot of pain to the lady. And this, uh, can you see that instrument, the leech cannula, which when it is screwed into the cervix, it hurts the lady. So even if you give some sedation, it's not a very comfortable thing. So you have to give sedation and you give a paracervical block. And there are a lot of complications of paracervical block sometimes. So yes, it is done in the outpatient process. It is painful and it is not enough information. So it tells you only about the uterus and the fallopian tubes. It doesn't tell you whether the tube is stuck, you know, whether this fallopian tube is stuck to the bowel behind like that, whether they're adhesions. It doesn't tell you that they're tubercles. It doesn't tell you that the ovary and the tube, they have... Uh, any additions or the tube is stuck to the bowel and the ovary somewhere else. All this anatomy is not made out. There is one video on YouTube with uh, my name. You, If you have time, you can see laparoscopy, uh, diagnostic laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. It is again from prep ladder, but it is there on the YouTube. You can see that video and I've showed you how to do a laparoscopy and why laparoscopy is better than hysterosalpingraphy because that is of the same patient. This patient's HSG is there. In this, the HSG is showing us perfectly normal tubes. But when we did a laparoscopy, it was totally stuck. There were so many additions and I had to do almost two hours of uh, procedure just to do the additional lysis when I did the laparoscopy. So what apparently is a normal tube which is open, inside the abdomen it is stuck. So a stuck tube is of no use. All right. That's why this lady was infertile. So that's why, what is the gist of all this information I gave you? This leech cannula is the one which is used for lap and dye and for hysteroscopy, uh, for uh, hysterosalpingography, but which is the best method of assessing tubal anatomy and uh, pelvic anatomy? It is a laparoscopy and hysteroscopy. Okay, chalo. Aage right. Hai. right. So what have you guys uh, answered so far? Can you please something about the menstruation index? Okay, lap and HSG, just like DNC. No, it's not uh, election, which is the best test for tubal patency. Best test for tubal, I've already answered that question. All right, so maturation index, um, I think it's a long topic. Maturation index is, uh, you know, you have to take the um, cells of the vagina and the cells of the vagina, you'll see the uh, basal cells and the parabasal intermediate cells and the superficial cells. And these cells, uh, you know, the superficial cells increase because of high estrogens and the parabasal cells increase because of high progesterone. Okay. So when there are many superficial cells, we know this patient is in the uh, phase of high estrogens. Okay, and when there are less, then we say estrogens are less and progesterones are more. So in pregnancy, there'll be a lot of uh, parabasal cells. And in uh, patients who are around mid-cycle, there'll be high amount of uh, estrogenic cells or the superficial cells. So based on this, we have an index. Okay, basal, parabasal, intermediate and superficial. Like that, we have the index, maturation index. Then it is used with the corny index, it is used with the karyopycnotic index. So all of this have to correlate when you're doing the findings. So there are many indices and the pathologists are the best people to teach you. I mean, I, I can teach you that, but uh, uh, slightly out of the purview of the, uh, you know, of this class because I've been discussing images here. So yes, you should know about the basal, parabasal, intermediate and superficial cells. Parabasal and intermediate cells, progesterone, uh, sorry, uh, basal and parabasal more with progesterone, intermediate superficial more with estrogens. At least that much you should know and then go and see the figures which are given in the books. Okay, now in this picture of a testes, here we have seen a magnification of the seminiferous tubules and in the seminiferous tubules, we have taken a section here. Can you see this section which I have taken? In this section, I'm showing you the microscopy here. See the microscopy here. In this, I'm showing you that there is spermatogonium first here. Then there is primary spermatocyte here. This one. Then there is the secondary spermatocyte here. Okay. And then there is the spermatozoa here. All right. Now, I've not shown you the spermatids here. So, which one of this is haploid? Or which one of this is diploid, you can tell me. Yes, spermatogonium is diploid. 
primary spermatocyte is diploid and secondary spermatocyte is haploid. So it becomes haploid here. So which one of this is haploid? So the secondary spermatocyte is haploid. Now, why am I giving you this picture? I gave you this picture because the exam question in your last NEET was, please arrange from spermatogonium, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, to spermatid and spermatozoa. Please arrange them from add luminal to luminal, just to trouble you. Add luminal to luminal. So please arrange these spermatogenesis intermediates from the add luminal area to the luminal area. That was the MCQ. Basically, it meant spermatogonium, primary spermatocyte, secondary spermatocyte, spermated and spermatozoa. Basically, it meant unko, just arrange them in a line in the order of formation. That's all it meant. Add luminal means away from the lumen and luminal means, of course, inside the lumen. So it is just a way of troubling you guys from add luminal to luminal basically means from the sides of the, from this place to this lumen of the, lumen of this uh, seminiferous tubule. Basically, it means that. So I just added one question here that which one of this is haploid. So haploid is the secondary spermatocyte onwards. It is haploid. So let's see. Okay, uh, Dr. Jigar, uh, we're discussing about this right now. So this is some information which I gave. I think if we go to the next question. Before that, uh, one, uh, I think add lumen to luminal, you understood. And uh, yeah, I can tell you something more here. How long does spermatogenesis take? It takes 72 days, spermatogenesis. Okay, but spermatid, spermatid to spermatozoa. Sperm, I'm writing. Spermatid to spermatozoa. This is known as spermiogenesis. Spermiogenesis. What is the duration of just spermiogenesis? Spermatogenesis from spermatogonium to spermatozoa. That is, yes, 72 days. But what is the duration of spermiogenesis? That is 22 to 24 days. All right. I don't know why that, uh, I don't know where uh, some mistake has happened in some of the notes of prep platter. I don't know where it happened that somewhere somebody has written 48 hours. So please correct that. 20, uh, I've checked my prep platter notes. It is written 22 to 24 hours, but maybe the first edition maybe had a mistake. So we agree that if there are some mistakes, we are here to correct. It is 22 to 24 days. All right. Chal. So uh, yes. Um, Spermogenesis. All right, you got it right. So there was this question my friend has asked. Uh, does the woman have normal periods in infertility? Jigger infertility is a very, very big topic. And uh, most people who have regular cycles uh, and um, they don't conceive are the ones who come to my OPD. So yes, most people have regular cycles and they don't conceive. Why? Because they have blocked tubes. Why? Because they're having a bad endometrium sometimes, which is not very healthy. It is having menstruation, but it is not having an implantation. So uh, they may be having regular periods, but yes, there are a lot of women who have infertility and they have delayed periods like in PCOS or in hyperprolactinemia, or they don't have any periods like in Escherman syndrome. So yes, you have to know your gynecology in and out before you become a uh, infertility specialist. So please know your gynae well before you become any super specialist in gynae. Know your surgery well before you become a laparoscopic surgeon. Okay. Know your uh, orthopedics well before you become an arthroscopic surgeon. So it's all very, very basic. Any surgical branch, you know, so many of you are going to do surgical branches. All of you who are doing surgery, surgery or surgical branches, don't get into super specialization immediately after your MS, whether it's MS gynae or MS surgery or MS ortho. Please work as a surgeon for three years. That SR ship, that registrar ship is there for you to get the experience of doing regular surgeries with confidence then get into super specialization. That is my advice. Of course, that's what I feel. And if you're not a very good basic surgeon and you start doing laparoscopy, you'll get stuck more, more than often. So please remember, always do your basic work uh, for many years before you super specialize. Now, what is this instrument? This is a very simple instrument. This, is, uh, this one is the curved. This is the curved sponge holder. 
sponge holder has a lot of work in gynecology. Of course, major job of the sponge holder is to hold a sponge and clean the area where you're operating, anywhere in surgery also. But the same sponge holder can be used for holding the rectus sheath if you don't have a good Alice forceps. If you don't have a good um, um, green armitage, you can use the sponge holder for holding the angles of the uterus. You know, the angles of the uterus, when they bleed, we put an Alice forceps. You interns have assisted so many cesareans. So we put Alice forceps. When you make an incision on the uterus, isn't it? When you're doing a cesarean section, and you made an incision here on the uterus like this. So these angles here, I'll draw with this. These angles here will bleed. So on these angles of the incision, you apply the Alice forceps. Or you can apply the best instrument to be applied is the green armitage, G-A-T. The green armitage. The green armitage is the best to be put on the angles when there is um, bleeding at a cesarean. But yes, if you don't have that, you can use this sponge holder. So this sponge holder can be used for holding the rectus sheath, for doing the holding the angles. And yes, we can also use it when we are trying to do a yes an MTP. Sometimes there are big chunks of fetal tissues which are not taken out by the ovum's forceps. So this one gives a better grip sometimes. But don't use it as a primary instrument. Please, ovum's forceps. We are discussing ovum's forceps today. Later on, please remember. Is it next? Yeah, it's here. So ovum's forceps is the one which is used for doing a MTP and ovum forceps does not have a lock. See, this ovum forceps does not have a lock here, but this one has a lock. So for an MTP, using this can be used for pulling out products, but the lock is a problem that you go into the uterus, see you're holding products and taking out, holding products, taking out. But suppose you perforate the uterus with this instrument and you hold bowel, and you lock your instrument, you're surely going to pull the bowel out of the uterus. That's a drastic injury. But if you hold the bowel with the ovum's forceps, there's no lock. So even if you hold the bowel by mistake and you pull, the bowel will slip through the, you may cause much less injuries with the ovum's forceps. You can perforate with both the instruments. If you're a little careless, you can perforate with both these instruments. But the injuries are bigger and uh, worse to manage when you have a sponge holder. So sponge holder can be used for that purpose of an MTP, but in experienced hands. Ideal instrument is the ovum's forceps. Okay, so that's the sponge holder. Now, what is this instrument? See, you must concentrate on this part. This has a cage. It has a cage, a protective cage. So when you want to hold the fallopian tube, in my specialty, I will say that, so this protective case. So if you apply this instrument here, so you will hold the tube, but you will not injure the tube. Look, the edges are blunt. See, these edges are blunt. So they will not injure the tube also. So yes, this is the Babcock's. This is the Babcock's forceps, which is used for holding the fallopian tube while you're doing a tubectomy or holding the fallopian tube when you're trying to do an ectopic pregnancy surgery or for holding the fallopian tube when you're trying to move it away when you're doing a myomectomy. So basically, tubal structures, delicate tubal structures. We also hold, use it for holding bowel. When we want to hold the bowel without crushing the bowel, we use this instrument. It has got blunt uh, tips. So when you hold the bowel, we can give a gentle traction when we're doing Adhesiolysis. Sometimes the bowel is totally stuck on the uterus. If I'm going to do a hysterectomy, I open the abdomen and see the bowel is all stuck sitting on the uterus. So we cannot just go ahead and do the surgery because bowel is on the place. So you have to slowly move the bowel away from this by adhesiolysis. So how do you hold the bowel? Use this blunt instruments. So it can be used also for holding bowel. So tubal structures can be held by a Babcock's. Okay. So that is a Babcock's. This was the sponge holder. Now, what is this one? Now this one is the this one is the ovum's forceps. This is the ovum's forceps, and this ovum's does not have a lock. See, it does not have a lock, so this is safer. And it has this. Um, if you see the head, it has these uh, serrations. You know, it is like this. It is not like that. Okay, it has got the serrations like this. So through this serrations, when you want to hold the fetal tissues, you don't go and hold the fetal tissues. You hold the tissues and pull them out. But there'll be blood also. So the blood will seep out through this so that you get a good grip on the tissues. Yes, it's a mean instrument. MTP is a mean procedure, isn't it? So 
So yes, so as a principal, I do MTPs only for dead babies, not for live babies. That, that's my own personal way of thinking. People who don't uh, want a child will get an MTP done. There's nothing wrong in it. Please don't judge me on that statement. I'm just saying I don't do MTPs uh, of live babies, dead babies, of course. I have done as a training, I have done. I'm not saying I've not done, but that's a person thing. Uh, we'll get into politics now. So let's leave that. So ovum's forceps is done, uh, used for the purpose of taking out the a fetus uh, when you're doing a evacuation process of a, uh, when you're doing a medical termination of pregnancy. Now, uh, let's see before I go into that one, what all have you asked me in these last three instruments? Okay. Ovum, ovum, Babcocks, holding tubular structures, fallopian tube, fallopian tube. Right. Yes. So uh, people have already started answering this question. Greenish yellow discharge a woman has. Greenish yellow frothy discharge. That's what is also one word which will come. Greenish yellow frothy discharge and microscopically reveals motile organisms. So yes, motile organisms with this flagellum. Motile organisms with this flagellum which are seen and this is seen in the vagina in a pap smear sometimes. It can be seen in a swab and you plate it on the slide, this swab and see, you can see this motile organ in a wet prep. In a wet prep, you can see this. So this is classically trachomoniasis. Trachomoniasis is uh, trachomonas vaginalis. It has got this flagellate organism. It is motile, causes severe itching. And this inflammation causes uh, inflammation of the vagina. Vagina is known as colpos. So colpitis macularis colpitis macularis red red macules in the vagina red macules in the vagina colpitis macularis so this is also other name for the strawberry vagina strawberry vagina strawberry cervix both you can see when you see trachomoniasis colpitis macularis green shallow frothy discharge the treatment is by doing a treatment is by doing a Yes, giving the patient metronidazole. That's the drug of choice. All right. And in trachomoniasis, remember, one sexual intercourse has the capacity up to 70% chance the man getting infected by this. So it is highly uh, contagious it, uh, when there is sexual uh, intercourse and the man should also be treated. So both, okay, the man and woman, both the partners should be treated when there is trachomoniasis. All right. And uh, I'm sure the next one is uh, your favorite MCQ. This one is coming more frequently than the trachomoniasis. What is this? Yes. Creamy white discharge with the fishy odor and clue cells on microscopy. Now, when you see clue cells, this is the clue, you know, clue. You are seeing this uh, picture on the microscopy. On the microscopy, you're seeing hundreds and thousands of small, small blue dots. They are the bacteria. So when the vaginal epithelial cell, can you see the vaginal epithelial cell? The vaginal epithelial is a polygonal cell like this. See, there are three cells here like that. So this is what you see somewhat when you do a vaginal smear or a cervical smear, you see this polygonal cells. Now polygonal cells with a nice uh, nucleus, large nucleus, mostly centrally placed. But there are these so many embedded bacteria. So many embedded bacteria in this so that is known as the clue it is the clue cell when you see the cell with uh, thousands of embedded bacteria it is known as a clue cell and clue cell is a diagnosis of yes bacterial vaginosis now bacterial vaginosis is not sexually transmitted so yes treat only the woman trachomonasis sexually transmitted treat man and the woman both Bacterial vaginosis, again, the drug of choice is metronidazole and metronidazole uh, is to be given only to the lady. The man does not need to have it because it's not sexually transmitted. It has this fishy odor and this fishy odor becomes even worse after sexual intercourse. Worse after sexual intercourse is the classical uh, information which is given. And um, this is also known as the AMSELS criteria, you know, creamy white discharge, fishy odor and uh, clue cells, whiff test. And the alkaline pH. All of these five, these are known as the AMSELS criteria. AMSELS criteria and more than three, 
more than or equal to 3 out of 5 is diagnostic of a bacterial vaginosis. Okay. Right. Let's see the next image. This is a laparoscopic view of the uterus, the pouch of Douglas, the ovaries on the sides and the fallopian tube. See, these are the fallopian tubes here. This is the fallopian tube here. Okay. What is the question in this image now? What is this structure which I'm highlighting with red? What is this structure? What is this structure here? Yes, which is making that inverted U. What is that structure? Come, I'm going to wait for the answers. Those who have seen this, I'm sure, I mean, have done laparoscopies, have assisted laparoscopy, or uh, have done uh, um, assistance in uh, caesareans also, or assistance in hysterectomies. You should be able to tell me. Broad ligament, wrong answer. Hmm, that is correct answer. Not puborectalis. All right. So, yes, somebody has answered it correct. I'm happy. This from the uterus, see, from the uterus towards the sacrum here. So, this is indeed the uterosacral ligaments. From the back of the uterus, there are two uterosacral ligaments. All right. So, this is this side and this is this side. And uterosacral ligaments, yes, they are also a good support of the uterus. And broad ligament will be here somewhere. It's not seen in this picture actually at all. This is the ovarian ligament is here. This is the ovarian ligament which I've uh, marked. This is the fallopian tube here. Okay. So this uterosacral ligament, this is the one which is resected. When we are trying to do, when a patient has, when a patient has severe dysmenorrhea, then sometimes we do resection of the hypogastric plexus or the hypogastric nerve. Now that is taking the pain from the pelvis to the brain. So that pain perception, if it is too much and you're not able to get any relief, then where you do the resection of the hypogastric plexus, we simply go inside and cut this. We simply go and cut this. Okay. So this is where the hypogastric plexus is going. Okay. So I'll draw this in yellow. This is the hypogastric plexus. So you cut this, then the perception. So this is known as laparoscopic um, uh, ablation of uh, laparoscopic ablation of the uterosacral nerve that's what we call it okay luna it used to be called or you say resection of the hypogastric plexus you can use lasers you can use cautery whatever but if you resect this then the patient has much lesser pain abdomen in dysmenorrhea is much lesser and endometriosis pain is much lesser adenomyosis pain is much lesser but yes, this is a highly uh, specialized procedure. I'm not seeing being much used. People prefer doing hysterectomies for women after 35 years rather than doing just this simple procedure of uterosacral nerve ablation. All right. Many names are given to this. Laparoscopic uterosacral nerve ablation. Like that it is called. Okay. Triangle of doom and triangle of pain. Uh... Obito. Okay. Now you have stumped me. Homework for me. All right. Let's be honest here. You have uh, learned these terms and I must get back to you about them. So write an email to me at drprasan at yahoo.com and I'll get back to you with these answers. Sometimes we also learn from you guys. Okay. Shalom. Now, this uh, one question from obstetrics has slipped into this uh, paper, but never mind. We can uh, do some discussion. Overlap is a common thing in obs and gynae. So, in this umbilical artery Doppler, this is A, this is B, and this is C. Which one of A, B, and C is suggesting? Severe compromise to the fetus. Which of these A, B, and C is suggesting severe compromise in the fetus? Yes. Let us see. What have you answered? Most of you answering B, C, B, and C, and B, B, B.
So we are talking about severe compromise and then we are talking about imminent death. There are two things. So that's why what I've asked you, yes, the question asked you was which one of this is suggesting a severe compromise? So yes, the answer is actually B, severe compromise. Severe compromise is this because there is no flow. There is systolic flow, no diastolic flow. Okay. Now, imminent death, baby about to die. Now, that is what is reversal diastolic flow. See, this reversal diastolic flow. So, uh, I uh, am revising my question. Which one of them is showing a severe compromise? Severe compromise is B. Okay, it is absent diastolic flow. Absent diastolic flow. We have some time still. Okay, reverse diastolic flow. Reverse diastolic flow like this last one. Reverse diastolic flow. We have no time in this. And reverse diastolic flow means the baby is about to die. So this basically, if the baby is beyond 34 weeks, we just do a cesarean section immediately. Even if it is before 34 weeks, like viable 28 to 34, again, I'll do a cesarean because baby is about to die. So we'll have to save it by taking it out. But when there is severe compromise, then we can try and save the baby by doing what? By giving some steroids, keeping the patient in a high-risk ward. We may get one or two days or maximum three days in a severe compromise. In a severe compromise, you have to do the Doppler uh, on a daily basis and see if the Doppler is still showing compromise but not reversal. You can buy some time for lung maturity by steroids and then do the cesarean or the delivery, whatever is appropriate at that moment. But if it is reversal diastolic flow, it means imminent death. So those who got B as the answer are correct, not C. All right, slightly tough question. Okay, what is a round ligament? Mm. Dr. Armour and Obito, you have had a discussion and you sorted out the triangles. Thank you. And uh, good, I did not give some uh, vague answer because you asked me something which is not in my specialty, I guess. So good, I did not attempt something. So you got the answers. Thanks for the discussion amongst yourselves. And uh, yes, most of you got the answer correct, but some of you thought as C, but that is wrong. Okay. Answer is B, severe compromise. Now, this is an image of a lady of her genitalia. I, I am sure that you're able to make out that this is a lady because there is a vulva here. Okay. And, uh, but this lady has a enlarged clitoris. And what is the most common reason for this finding in a girl of 17 years? This is one of the patients, which uh, last year I saw it around this time, Feb, I think we saw this. Okay. So what is this image? And what is the cause of this happening in a young girl? Okay. I'm sure that most of you have got the idea. Yes, you got it as congenital hyperplasia. But then what is the enzyme deficiency? So the most common enzyme deficiency is 21 hydroxylase. Correct. 21 hydroxylase deficiency is the cause of this. Clitoromegaly, clitoromegaly, 21 hydroxylase deficiency causing congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Guys, nowadays we will not be asked congenital adrenal hyperplasia. See, this is not looking like a small girl, isn't it? I'm telling you it is a 17-year-old girl. So, you will not get congenital adrenal hyperplasia. You will get adult onset adrenal hyperplasia. So, don't be too surprised if you get the latest nomenclature because congenital adrenal hyperplasia is what happens in the newborn sit presence. And this adrenal hyperplasia, what is the most common cause of adrenal hyperplasia? Most common cause of adrenal hyperplasia is 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Correct. Now, adrenal hyperplasia can happen in the intrauterine life, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. But this adrenal hyperplasia may present only in the puberty and beyond, late adult onset adrenal hyperplasia. All right. So, I know most of you knew what I'm talking. I'm just trying to help you with the nomenclature. So please be careful that you must also think in terms of the new terminology. And this is adult onset adrenal hyperplasia. More specific answer. Okay. Chalo. So what is the second most common? 
most common is 17 hydroxylase. Sorry, 21 hydroxylase. What is the second most common? Second most common is 11 hydroxylase deficiency. Okay, don't say 17. 17 is after 11 hydroxylase deficiency. So most common is 21 hydroxylase. Second is 11. So this this picture. I'm sure all of you have taken it from prep ladder or from some of my notes. And this is around 11 years, 12 years back. I had made this slide and uh, I you know got it from all the you know the uh, the steroid pathway and the androgen pathway. Both are given separately in all the books. Given together, I think it's in Novak. It is given as a huge chart now. But I try to compress it into an easy chart so that all of us can revise it. Please learn this chart. Whatever specialty you're going to do in your life, you should know this chart. Okay. So in this, if you see the cholesterol, it is broken down to steroids and it is broken down to androgens. So this is the basic of this adrenal steroid pathway. And in this, if there is some enzyme deficiency like 21 hydroxylase deficiency, then the steroids are not made. So when the steroids are not made, there is no feedback of steroids to the brain and the brain stimulates the pituitary to send more and more um, ACTH and that will act on the adrenal gland to make more and more a breakdown of cholesterol in the adrenal gland and that cholesterol will be driven to make more and more androgens. So this androgens will increase because 21 hydroxylase is deficient. So when there's 21 hydroxylase deficiency, androgen production increases and that is known to cause either early onset, which is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or late onset, which is known as adult onset adrenal hyperplasia. Right. So, again, I'll just show this picture clearly to all of you. Okay. Anything else you guys ask me? Okay, fine. Now, what is this one? What is this instrument? This instrument is also used for sterilization. And some of you answered it when I was asking you the, when I was asking you the other instruments earlier on. What is this instrument? Yes. So this is that fellow ring, okay? This is the fellow ring, and this is the one which is classically mostly we use the fellow ring. Yes, I showed you the clips because those clips are giving us the best reanastomosis success. We have decent anastomosis, reanastomosis success with fellow rings, and this is what is uh, generally used in the uh, family planning programs in most of your hospitals. Laparoscopic sterilization, we slip this tube, you know, this um, uh, slip this ring over the tube. So this is a fallopian tube. These fellow rings are stretched and put over this. So this, uh, we make a loop of this. Uh, how do I show this to you? Let me show this to you with this wire here. So make a loop like this. This is the fallopian tube. We make a loop of this fallopian tube and this ring is slipped over this. This ring is slipped over this and it is tightly going to hold this ring. Is tightly going to hold the tube and it is going to stop the blood supply and this is going to cause the tube to become ischemic. I'm sure all of you have assisted at least if you've not uh, uh, done them in your internship. Yes, um, internship mostly you will do some open tubectomies. You will assist the laparoscopic tubectomies. I'm sure you've assisted. Now what is this instrument which is used? Hmm, I'm going to wait for this answer. What is the use of this instrument? Let's see. Fallopring with laprocator. Yes, uh, Dr. Rao, we can reverse. We can do. It is, see, it is a, a reversible uh, contraception. When you use this uh, fallopring, so you use uh, clips, it is irreversible. If you do it properly, it is reversible. Yes, you can cut that segment and re -anastomose. Similarly, in fallopring's also, you can re -anastomose. A surgery reanastomosis is fairly good. The best reanastomosis success is by laparoscopic clips. We've discussed that. So what is this? Yes, anybody? Yes. Correct. KKC. KKC, you've been answering a few uh, easy, I mean, difficult ones quite easily. Not bad. So this is the instrument. It is the ring. It is the ring forceps, which is holding the vas when we're doing a vasectomy. So, in a case of non-scalpel vasectomy, we use these instruments. This, uh, what we do, we um, get into the scrotum. Of course, we give local anesthesia. After that, it's a five-minute process. Basically, it's done in the OPD. After giving local, we stab the scrotum. We stab the scrotum with a sharp artery forceps. We get into the scrotum, stab it, and open it. And we'll hold the vas and pull it out. Now, when we pull the vas out, when we pull the vas out, that vas, when you pull the vas out, that vas is stabilized by this ring forceps like this. 
this reinforcer will stabilize the vas. So two reinforcers like that you apply, you know, two like that you apply, and then you do the ligation of the vas. So ring forceps is used to stabilize this vas when you're doing a vasectomy, the non-scalpel vasectomy. Okay. Now, this is that laprocator. Maybe I should have given this after the fellow bring. Yes, somebody mentioned this is that laprocator. So that fellow bring which I showed you, that fellow bring is slipped here. So what we do with this, you know, these two prongs which are coming out, these prongs will go and hold the fallopian tube. These prongs will go and hold the fallopian tube like this. You hold the fallopian tube and this will be pulled into the cylinder, this long cylinder. Okay, this is the cylinder. So these two prongs will go out. They'll hold the fallopian tube and pull them. And then this ring will be slipped over this. So that will cause the uh, fallopian ring to be placed like this over the fallopian tube. So this is the laprocator. This is that instrument. Laprocator. It is basically the laparoscopic clip applicator. Or laparoscopic ring applicator. So laparoscopic ring applicator, we don't call it such a, you know, sister, please give me the laparoscopic ring applicator. We don't, we say, sister, give me the laprocator. You know, that's how it is. So this is the fellow ring, which is slipped over this laprocator here. Okay. Chalo, what are the questions you guys have asked me? Sanjit, I can understand that you have worked a lot in your internship writing discharge summaries. But then um, if you've just finished your internship and you're while doing your internship and you're just about to finish it, take it from me. You're going to get your PG in your first attempt if you worked very hard. Yes, we make you write a lot of discharge summaries because we wrote a lot of discharge summaries. That's how it is. We give it back to the interns. But then um, that's part of your growing up and don't feel too bad. One day you'll be sitting on a forum like this and you'll be telling your juniors that those who work hard in the internship get the best seats. You'll be also able to say that. I'm sure you'll do that. Okay, all the best. Obito. Okay. Right. Shallow. Now, there is this uh, laparotomy I'm doing. And this laparotomy, I have taken out the uterus outside the body of the woman. See, this is the incision here. This is the doins retractor I've used here. Slightly modified type of doins. And this is the uterus which has come out. See, this is the fallopian tube here. This is the other fallopian tube here. Uterus is outside the abdomen. This one has many fibroids. See, there's a fibroid here. There's a fibroid here. There's a fibroid here. Here. It took me a good uh, two hours to just to take out the fibroids. So, what is the question? What type of fibroid is pointed by this instrument? With this instrument, I'm pointing out. With my finger also, I'm pointing out one fibroid. What type of fibroid is this? So, maybe after that uh, FIGO classification, I should have given you this question. But never mind. What is this type of fibroid? Yes, there are many fibroids in this uterus. Some of you would have not been able to make out the uterus because it is so disfigured because of the fibroids. Yes, I've taken out... Um, how many fibroids have taken out? My record, I think it was 83 or 84. 84, I think. 84 fibroids in one woman. Yes, multiple, hundreds. I mean, <laughs> you call them hundreds, but yes, there are plenty of fibroids. I got around 84 fibroids, big and small. And we had to open the cavity also and took out the fibroids. And we thought that we'll end up in a hysterectomy, but that patient conceived. Yes. Yes, remember, after a myomectomy, I have not given the answer to this one. After a myomectomy, mostly, whenever you make an incision, see, I've got to make an incision here, 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 so many incisions I'm going to make. Even if I make one incision, the uterine wall gets weakened. So whether you open the cavity or you don't open the cavity while doing a myomectomy, after a myomectomy, when a woman is pregnant, the delivery is done by a cesarean. Just keep it as a rule, even if you become a gynecologist, all right? Okay. Pedunculated subserous fibroid. Pedunculated subserous fibroid. Are, but you're not telling me the type. Yes, Ina Sheikh has correctly said it and Sachin has said it. So yes, what type of fibroid we're going to ask you? Subserous pedunculated, we know, of course. They'll ask you in the exams notice what type of fibroid. Did I ask the question properly? Yes, what type of fibroid? This, that's what I asked you. 
What type of fibroid? Yes, it is the sub serous pedunculated, correct? But what type it is? Type 7. And these are the ones, they sometimes get torsion. Sometimes they will move over the seat. There's a peduncle here. On this peduncle, it may turn like this. So when it gets into a torsion, then this will get detached and this fibroid will be stuck. It will be parasitic, it will be moving in the abdomen. Somewhere it might be attached under the diaphragm or in the momentum, like I told you, might be lying in the pouch of Douglas, getting its blood supply. So it is now then called a parasitic fibroid. These sub are the ones which become parasitic more likely than others. Okay. What is this ovary having? Yes. Now, that is a question which uh, I'm sure all of you are going to jump on it and going to answer immediately. So, I'm not going to ask you the obvious question. This is a PCOS ovary given. If this is an ovary, then this is a polycystic ovary. Correct. How many follicles on the ultrasound is the PCOS ovary? That's the criteria has changed in the last two years. That's the MCQ here. PCOS, PCOS won't do. Pearl of necklace of pearl. Yes, sir. Please give a lot list of last minute topics to revise. 2029, 20, 20, 9, 9, 20, 12, 12. 9 is a 9 size. Hota hai. 9 is the size. So the follicles are 2 to 6 millimeters in size. And always less than 9 millimeters. That's the 9 which is troubling you, I'm sure. So 2 to 6 millimeters is the size. These are the antral to preantral size follicles. And more than 20 per ovary. Okay. More than 20 per ovary are required to make your diagnosis of PCOS. Yes, earlier, two years back, it was 12. Now, three years. 12 per ovary, but that is old now. So, we don't use that criteria anymore. Yes, uh, some old books, if you're reading some old guidebooks. That's why if you're reading some MCQ books, please don't go beyond three years MCQs. Beyond three years, don't go. Just read the last three years MCQs when you're reading from whichever source. I think the best source of MCQs are your teachers. I'm sure nowadays uh, the world has changed for the last three, four years. There's so many online sources and forget the online sources. If you don't buy any apps, just go ahead and see YouTube. I mean, like uh, this is detrimental to my own app, I'm sure. But uh, most of us have an online presence and we are giving you free answers to all the MCQs which have been discussed in the latest exams. And that's the best kind of practice you can do. All the MCQs answered by your own teacher. The one you, uh, any teacher you like, any subject, whichever teacher you like, that teacher has online presence. Go ahead and do the MCQs with that teacher. So the specialist of that subject, you know, you like a, a pathologist and that pathologist who is teaching you is also solving the MCQs. So he'll also tell you the wrong choices which are given in the guidebooks. And he'll tell you if this is a choice, then that is the answer. Then that is the choice and this is the answer. That kind of discussion can only happen in a live forum or in a recorded forum by a teacher who is especially in that subject so guidebooks are uh, you know they they fade in front of a teacher taking a class for you so if that pathologist is giving you all the possible choices and the wrong choices which are given in the exam then that's the best discussion of that mcq so please do three years mcqs from the youtube whichever subject you like and that's more than enough preparation of mcqs apart from the theory which you read okay so yes any questions you ask me on pcos No more questions, right? So we'll move on. Thanks, Dr. Rao. Now, this is a very famous uh, acronym. Okay. And it is from uh, Gynecology and Obstetrics Journal. Page number also mentioned. So this is not mine. It is a FIGO classification. And this FIGO classification is for what pathology? That's your MCQ. Yes, you're seeing that there is a PALM which is given here see it is in dark and then there is this so this is the palm coin classification palm coin polypedinomasis leomyoma malignancy coagulopathy ovulatory dysfunction endometrial causes iatrogenic causes and not otherwise classified causes so what is this classification for what is the purpose of this classification please remember this classification yes some of you have answered Yes. 
Yes. This is the classification for abnormal uterine bleeding. And uh, when I say abnormal uterine bleeding, please remember, this is the accepted classification now. I'm so happy that uh, somebody knows what I've been teaching. KKC, TIPS CD. Yeah, that's my classification. And I used to like it so much. But triple K, KKC rather. What has happened that um, they asked you this in MCQ around three years back in some exam. I forgot which one. That uh, palm coin is a classification of which uh, disorder. So for abnormal uterine bleeding, now international one classification has been accepted. And whether I say tip CD or what I, whichever way I teach you, this classification is the one which is now accepted. So across the world, if you want to send a reference, you want to uh, you know uh, uh, publish a paper about abnormal bleeding and you want to tell a cause, so you will say this woman is having abnormal uterine bleeding because of a fibroid. So we will write that as AUBL. Or it is because of a malignancy like endometrial cancer. So I will write it AUBM. So this is what has become now an accepted classification. You cannot help it. What is the utilization of this information in your exams? Your exams are getting tougher in the way they are asking the questions. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Once again, your exams are getting tougher in the way they are asking the question. So the same information about the fibroid, they are not going to write a fibroid. They are going to write, a woman at 48 years presents to you with abnormal uterine bleeding L. A woman presents to you with AVUBL at 48 years of age and she is para 3 life 3. Which of the following is the best management of this woman? So nowhere they've written a fibroid, but they've written AUBL. So you should know the classification of palm coin and you should know AUBL means abnormal uterine bleeding because of leomyoma. And you know that at 48 years, if a woman has already had her children and she's bleeding too much, you'll do a hysterectomy. So it is just that you know the answers, you know the subject well. They're just trying to ask you the same question in a different way. AUBL or AUBE or AUBC, whatever they're going to give you, just for the sake of testing whether you know the classification. So that's why I mentioned this one. And uh, let's move on and see what is this. This ultrasound picture is showing a uh, ovary. In fact, it is showing two ovaries. There is one ovary here. And there is one ovary here. So both ovaries are so big that they are in the pouch of Douglas and they are huge ovaries. And I think you can make out there are multiple big follicles. You know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. In this section, if you turn this ovary, the same ovary, you'll see many more. 16 here, then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 here. So yes, what is this? I'm sure all of you would have got it. This is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, uh, this ovary. And uh, if you have um, less than 20, suppose they'll give you a picture with 7, 8 follicles like that. Then we are doing an IVF and in IVF we want 7-8 follicles. So that's a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation. So what is controlled ovarian hyperstimulation? We try to get 6 to 15 follicles in in vitro fertilization. Okay, 6 to 15 follicles we try to get. And if we get that, uh, let's say 10 follicles in a woman, then we are hoping that at least 7, 8 become good embryos. Then we can transfer to embryos and store the remaining 6 as a, a balance for this woman's later pregnancies. So that's the best case scenario. Five, 6 to 15 embryos, 6 to 15 oocytes you require when you're doing IVF. But if they become too many, that is more than 20 that is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And you know, it increases the estrogen, increase estrogen, increase HCG, which is given as a trigger, will increase the vascular endothelial growth factor, which will increase the vascular permeability. So when the vascular permeability increases, then there's fluids which are going to move out of the intravascular space. It's going to collect in the third space. The patient is going to have edema, ascites, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and the patient can get very sick also. Sometimes patients can die. All right. Touch wood. Uh, I've had a lot of cases of OHSs in my life. 
and most of them most of them kya all of them have gone home most of them have conceived so that's what i wanted to say ohss is, is something which you should have your good basic uh, um, gynecology done nicely and then if you see ohss you should be able to manage you should have good experience in your icu management also all right and uh, in ascites because of ohss okay please it is a different pathology there is increased vascular permeability and please in this patient there is hypovolemia inside the vessels so in this ascites do not say i will give lasix okay in ascites because of hypoproteinemia lot of people give lasix prosomide as a, a temporary management but please in a case of ovin hyperstimulation syndrome with ascites don't think in terms of frozemide because there is intravascular hypovolemia okay so be careful what is the most common cause yes it is not thecal lutein cyst also looks similar no 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 relaxed nature thecal lutein cyst is not similar good wrong answer uh, doctor i'm so happy you said that thecal lutein cyst is mostly unilocular or bilocular you know what do you mean by that unilocular and bilocular that is there is one loculated collection like this or there might be just another loculi like this okay this one has multiple loculi like this so multiple loculi don't think in terms of thecal lutein cyst good mistake Good, good. That's why I want you to do mistakes when we're taking a class. Okay. Uh, side effects of um, yes, side effects of infertility treatment, and it is also associated with yes, your friend who had this picture. Yes, this picture. This is the woman. PCOS have more chance of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Yes, that is correct. So PCOS has high AMH. PCOS are the ones when we go and do IVF, they are the ones who have, as it is, around 20 follicles. And you give minimal amount of stimulation by FSH, all 20 will become big. And more than 20 is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. My uh, personal uh, record of number of eggs, which I've taken out in IVF, is 47. Yes, that patient is fine. She's gone home. She's... Uh, uh, now in the process of uh, you know her you know we don't make them yes please remember when there are many eggs and she's in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome that cycle when you did IVF she should not conceive because conception will also increase the HCG so this high HCG which I told you this high HCG is likely the cause along with high estrogen which is causing the ovarian hyperstimulation manifestations so that increased permeability so high estrogen and high HCG so in this cycle, this woman should not conceive because conception also increases the HCG. So we say that store these eggs, store these eggs and use the store these eggs by, uh, of course, we don't store them as eggs. We make them embryos. We take the husband's sperms and make the embryos because embryo storing is easier. So store them as embryos and these embryos are now kept for later use when this woman recovers from this OHSS. Okay, so we can do. That's what I was saying that I was talking to you about my patient who had 47 eggs. So we have stored the eggs after making them embryos. And now next month, I think we're going to just do a transfer of the frozen embryos for her. Okay. So ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, manage the ascites by tapping, manage the intravascular uh, hypovolemia by fluids. So basically it means keep taking out the fluids, ascites and pleural effusion, and keep giving fluids to maintain the intravascular volume. So, we do the tapping of SITs, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion, and oral fluids, IV fluids, IV fluids my best is albumin, starch. So keep giving fluids and keep taking out fluids. So give IV fluids to replenish the intravascular volume, oral fluids to replenish that. And the best IV fluid is, of course, you can give sodium chloride, you can give dextrose, but the best IV fluid, which will have which will increase the oncotic pressure and keep the fluids inside the intravascular compartment. And that is the albumin. Albumin and starch are very good. Better is albumin. And keep taking out the fluids. Keep tapping the ascites because the ascites gets very tense. And uh, tense ascites, you know, will cause respiratory discomfort also.
All right. So, um, how long embryos can be saved? That's a good question, uh, Nil. Um, see, uh, embryo storage is for five years. Yeah. In our country, the rules are same as the British laws, and the British law says that we should do embryo storage for five years. In special circumstances, like a patient is a cancer patient, then we can store the eggs and the embryos for beyond five years. That is up to 10 years. And uh, we have a lot of information about uh, embryos which are stored up to 10 years and they have been transferred and acceptable amount of chromosomal defects and anomalies and abortions acceptable. Hai. All of this is more. IVF does have more abortions and does have the chances of having more uh, chromosomal anomalies. Uh, you know, remember I discussed in the beginning of this class, the azospermia factor and azospermia factor C will have some sperms and I can take those sperms and put them into the oocyte and the woman may have a child. But that child, if it is a boy, will have the same azospermia factor from the father in this baby also. So this boy, when he grows up, he will also be infertile and he'll also undergo the same process. So yes, there are more chances of anomalies when we are interfering with nature. But at least we're giving children which are healthy. Most children born are healthy, but relative more chances of abnormalities and chromosomal defects. All right. So we don't store them much beyond five years. Special circumstances, 10 years. Beyond that, we are not very sure because now storing for so long may increase the abnormalities and mutations and the chromosomal defects. Right. I have recently transferred in one of my patients. She had a baby when she was... Uh, uh, you know, first IVF around nine years back she did. And now she had a last I, uh, second IVF last year. She has another baby. And the special circumstances were that uh, she had uh, separated from the husband and then they re got again together. So they showed us the legal papers and then we allowed them the transfer. So they have two children now with the same one IVF. So up to 10 years is allowed in special circumstances. Apart from, okay, yeah, what is the most uh, common cause of OHSs? Most common cause is trompensitrate. Worse, severe OHSs. Severe OHSs is by recombinant FSH and HMG injections. This, so we get more eggs, so more chances. Trompensitrate is the most common cause of OHSs. Letrozole can also cause, yes. I've had patients who had mild OHSs with letrozole. All right, so next one, what is this? I'll show you a procedure and you tell me what's happening here. Again, this is the ovary. That much I can tell you. Now, why am I doing this procedure? Yes. I'm not asking you what is this procedure. They might just give you a picture of an ovary with a quattery on this. So, yes, all of you know this is the, yes, uh, yes, it is the laparoscopic ovarian drilling. Correct. Now, why is this done? Why is this done? You should know that. It is done for PCOS. Okay. It is done for PCOS. Why? For cases which are not getting treated by your regular, not having response. So when there is no response, no response to regular ovulation induction, when there is no response to regular ovulation induction, then we say we have to do a ovarian drilling. So what is the principle of ovarian drilling? The principle of ovarian drilling is that we are burning the stroma burning the stroma please you're not bursting the follicles you're burning the stroma you're not bursting the follicles okay burning the stroma to reduce to reduce local androgens you burn the stroma to reduce the local androgens all right shall we? So when the local androgens are lesser in the ovary, then the follicles become softer. See, high androgens locally in the stroma 
will make follicles very hard. And those hard follicles don't respond to your clomphene citrate and letrozole and HMG, all that. So you burn the stroma, reduce the local androgens, make the follicles a little softer, and they will respond to your ovulation induction better. Okay, some of them will uh, start ovulating by themselves. They may not need your drugs once you do the ovarian drilling. All right. This, uh, the, the benefits of this laparoscopic open drilling are limited uh, for the next two, three years because a lot of people, uh, they get into high stromal uh, androgens eventually. So after laparoscopic open drilling, you should be more aggressive in your treatment so that she conceives fast. Okay, shall Trauma is drilled. Okay. Yes, you can read the notes and you can read the MCQs uh, in the last uh, three years on YouTube. And those MCQs are like uh, the INICT, the MCI exam. Please see them also. And of course, the NEAT exam. So these last three years do all these papers and do the notes. I think that's more than enough. And whatever extra is there, we keep revising you with these sessions. So keep attending these sessions. You'll definitely get more information. Now, what is this procedure being done? Yes, what procedure is being done in this room, in this picture? Yeah, I'm sure uh, if it's a gynecology class and we're doing a discussion, then I'm sure you're able to make out what, what procedure is being done here. Yeah. Uh, I could have shown you a video, but then the video doesn't make sense because it's not going to come as a video question, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Over intracytoplasmic injection. Kya hota yaar? No, no. Pseudo doctor, that's wrong. Intracytoplasmic. Over in the egg. This is the egg. See the egg. So the procedure is ICSI. Intracytoplasmic sperm injection. You think we'll ask you such a simple question? We are going to ask you what is this structure here? Come on. That is a question. You know this um, MBBS where you can tell me now. Tell me now. What is this structure here? And did you get that right? Most of you know the answer to this one also. Correct. That is a polar body. Good. If you know this, I'm happy. This is the polar body and polar body. Now, um, why I'm asking you this, there's a ICSI is done. And when we do the ICSI, we keep the polar body at 12 o'clock. We rotate the, we rotate the oocyte in a way that oocyte is kept uh, in a way that when we see this, the holding pipette, it has got a negative suction here. And we are holding the oocyte with a negative suction. And then when I'm putting this needle into this oocyte, while I do ICSI, I'm very careful that ICSI is done with the polar body at 12 o'clock. Why? Because the mitotic spindle is here. So I release the sperm of this gentleman. There's a sperm which is loaded here. Okay, the sperm is released here. So we do not, at the near the polar body is the mitotic spindle the mitotic spindle might get damaged if you inject there. So that's why the oocyte is held in a particular method that we hold it with the polar body at 12 o'clock and we inject the uh, sperm below this midline of this oocyte so that the mitotic spindle is not affected. So yes, I wish I could have shown you the video now. I think uh, I'll have to transfer it from somewhere. So let's not waste time. And if you have any questions, you can ask me. I think that's about it. Oh no, there's more. Okay, tell me, what is this patient having? When I examined this young girl who came to me with acute urinary retention at 3 in the morning of 16 years of age. And to relieve her urinary retention, I put in a catheter into her urethra. And when I examined this, I saw this image. What is this problem? Okay. All right, guys, most of you got it. Uh, how do you know it is hematocolpus? See, with this, you don't know hematocolpus. You assume that there'll be blood beyond that. Correct. It is 
hematocorpus i'm sure you you understand but what is the answer this is a imperfect hymen and imperfect hymen will have hematocorpus which you'll diagnose by doing a per rectal examination what is the treatment of that you'll make an incision like this isn't it what is that you call it a cruciate incision like cross you make a cross cruciate incision so yes let's do that in this picture we are making a cross a cruciate incision here all right, you make an incision. It's a cross which I've made, just like you said. And there it comes out. All that pent up blood which is there in this lady. Okay. That is the hematocorpus which is drained. So, all that pent up blood which came out. Because she's 16 and she should have started menstruating at uh, 13 years at least. So, three years of blood. So, every month it is roughly 50. So, every year it is around 600 ml. So, in three years it should be 1800 ml at least. Yes, this woman had around 2.1 liters of old blood which came out. We collected into a large kidney tray and showed it to the parents. This girl had such a big uterus, which was such a big um, vagina and the uterus. So why did she have urinary retention? So that's what we have to see. I'll try to show you here. Why did she have a urinary retention? So you must understand. This is the normal anatomy here. Pubic symphysis. rectum and the sacrum. So this is the normal anatomy. Now, if this gets blocked here, is this an imperforate hymen? So blood will collect all over here. In the uterus also, it will collect obviously here like this. But the blood which collects in the vagina, now this is going to distend the vagina very, very much. It's going to distend. And this distended vagina is going to compress the bladder neck against the pubic symphysis. This compression of the bladder neck is going to cause this woman to have a big bladder like this, which will be full of urine. So that urinary retention is because of the urethra getting compressed against the pubic symphysis. So this woman came to me and you won't believe it, but this is how it is that uh, my residents call me and say, so this patient has come with acute retention of urine. What's the age? This age is 16 years. So the on the phone itself, I asked them that did she girl uh, have a periods? Has she come of age? Did she attain puberty? And my resident has not asked that. This has happened many times. I mean, at least three, four times I can say that on the phone I asked them that did she girl, did the girl have periods? And the resident is like, sir, she has come with retention of urine, nothing to do with the periods. I said, at least ask her. And then after five minutes, my resident will call. So she has primary menorrhea, she not had periods. And uh, I think it's a case of imperfect hymen, not because I've seen it. But with experience, you know that imperfect hymen, the girls will not talk to the mothers and the mothers, even if they don't know, not will talk to the fathers and they'll be hush hush about this. And one fine day, this girl is going to have such a big distension of the vagina, it's going to compress the urethra and going to cause a urinary retention. All right. So that can happen. All right, guys, a uh, lot of questions we discussed. Any uh, doubts you have? You can ask me, guys. Okay. Gartner cyst, yes, Gartner cyst is not in the vagina, correct? Gartner cyst, I, I'm so sorry, Gartner cyst is not in the vulva, it is in the vagina. Gartner cyst is here somewhere. This is the Gartner cyst. And Bartholin cyst is in the vulva. Bartholin cyst is here. Here you will see the Bartholin cyst. So yes, this is Bartholin's. And this is the Gartner's. Gartner cyst is the remnant of the male duct in the female uh, uh, pelvis. So, in the female genitalia, the male duct will get obliterated, and the remnant of the Gartner remnant of the male duct uh, is in the it uh, obliterates like this here. So, the lower end of the remnant of the male duct or the mesonephric duct can become cystic, and that is known as the cyst of Gartner or Gartner cyst. Cystocil versus Gartner cyst. Um, Gartner is high in the vagina. So, cystocil cannot, uh, I mean, it's very rare that uh, Gartner cyst will come out because in the very lax vagina, in a very lax vagina, 
cystocil may be uh, you know in a very lax vagina gartner cyst may come out you know it may come out like this very rare but a cystocil is basically because of uh, laxity of the vagina so when you tell the woman to strain the cystocil becomes bigger that is very classical gartner cyst will not become like that will not become bigger with the straining and uh, what is it you ask imperfect hymen and gartner's and uh, imperfect hymen and cystocil i'm sure you will not uh, misunderstand imperfect hymen is straightforward nikhil singh testicular feminization it's my favorite topic but you have to listen to the disorders of sexual development first that's a topic of around 2 hours on the app and it's my favorite class all i can say that testicular feminization syndrome is a boy it's a 46 xy boy who looks like a very pretty girl all right it's a 46 xy boy who's got no working androgens so androgens are not there and the androgens which are uh, uh, not working they keep getting converted into estrogens and those estrogens will give a lot of feminine body to this girl breast will be also present and the girl will be very feminine but the girl will not have any pubic hair because androgens are not working so very pretty girl without pubic hair that's what is a testicular feminization the person is actually genetically a boy 46 xy right elon musk and dr lulu and everybody else acrosome mitochondria what do you want to ask me about that acrosome mitochondria acrosome was this a question i mean like two people suddenly asked me about acrosome mitochondria this is the acrosomal cap of the sperm this is the neck and this is the tail so acrosome has il uro nidase which is also known as acrosin so this when the acrosome cap bursts this will release a lot of hyaluronidase which is known as acrosin and 1 lakh that is 100000 sperms are required to make the zona pellucida all right this zona pellucida this is the oocyte with the zona pellucida this is the zona pellucida this area is the zona pellucida and the sperms how many are required 100000 1 lakh sperms are required 1 lakh sperms are required to soften the zona pellucida to allow that one lucky sperm to go inside and after that the zona hardens again so acrosome reaction for the sperm to go inside and uh, once the sperm goes inside the zona hardens again it is known as cortical reaction so that no more sperms can come inside i thought you were asking i am acrosome acrosome has mitochondria anyway i'm not able to get the question doesn't matter i think we'll move on now because uh, it's already 1 o'clock and i was supposed to take a one hour session it's become 2 hours and 8 minutes so i think i'll take your leave and uh, uh, i'm sure that tomorrow we are meeting uh, i forgot the time please confirm i think it's around 5 or 6 so uh, just confirm the time i'll confirm with my team and we'll meet you tomorrow for the ops class and if you have any doubts about ops and gyne in total totality you can ask me okay so we'll meet tomorrow evening until then guys keep sending me your queries at uh, drprasan@yahoo.com otherwise you can send me through uh, preplata forum and we are here to always help you with your queries all the best guys keep reading and keep your spirits high that's what is very important all right guys bye bye Thank you.